So at this time, I'm very excited to introduce our keynote speaker, Rachel Davis Mercy. I always want to say Mercy Davis, and so I'm trying to be really good. So Rachel Davis Mercy is associate professor um, in the Medill School of Journalism, Media, Integrated Marketing, and Communications. <laughs> That's not my fault. Um, Rachel joined Northwestern, the Medill faculty, in 2008. Prior to that, she'd been at the University of Minnesota and uh, had worked at the Arizona Republic uh, in Phoenix as part of a news team that launched uh, the newspaper's weekly tabloid um, targeting women 18 to 34. Um, here at Northwestern, in addition to being um, a faculty member of Medill, her specialization is in audience understanding with a focus on the craft of, of journalism. Um, she serves as the executive director of the newly constituted Media Leader Leadership Center in Medill, and she's a fellow at Northwestern University's Institute of Policy Research. Her first book is Can Journalism Be Saved? Rediscovering America's Appetite for News was published in August 2010 and to just rave reviews. And um, you know, I had an opportunity to kind of scan them as, um, as I was preparing to introduce Rachel and was struck by one of the um, one of the very positive, among them very positive reviews, was one that started out, this straight talking book. And uh, if you know Rachel, you would know that she's very straight talking. I had the opportunity to work with her on the search for um, Brad, Brad Hamm and, and the, um, to become Dean of Medill. And uh, so we're really looking forward to her presentation today. I'm sure it will be straight talking. And with that, Rachel, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to introduce myself by saying that I'm so excited to be here when Jake um, asked me to do this. I was especially excited, but I want you all to know that you have now provided my biggest success with my father. My father was a career Navy man on submarines for 30 plus years, and everything I've done, he just feels like is a little squishy. Like, why would someone go to the New York Times and talk? I don't understand why someone would work with Al Jazeera. I don't really get what you do. And when I told him that I was invited to give the keynote at the Best Practices Forum, this is my father who sends me um, Harvard Business Review articles about how I should be managing my classroom. He thinks this is the pinnacle of my professional accomplishments. He called yesterday to make sure that I knew what I was going to wear, that I had a good breakfast planned, and that I was going to get a good night of sleep. I mean, my father finally feels like I have arrived. So I want to thank you for that. As an only child, that's a big deal. It's taken a long time, but I'm really proud of that. But his second most proudest accomplishment may be that you just called me straight talking, because that's obviously where I learned that from. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, Rather than kind of belabor the point of what I study, I thought it would be more helpful to you to talk in the aggregate about social media and the role of social media for professional development. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my work. I'm going to talk some about the work of other people and give you some context for how we think about media innovation and where we are now with the role of social media. So um, I appreciate some of you are probably not going to join Twitter or Facebook ever, but at the very least, maybe this will make you sympathetic to your kids' conversations about those things, and maybe some of you are very active there, and I hope this helps you think about the diversity of things you can be doing in that space. Oh, sorry. Um, I think it's important to understand the context of innovation as we think about social media, and newspapers are a great example. So when newspapers came about, the big fear in American society is that people would stop talking to one another, that we would just bury ourselves in the news. And if any of you have young people at home, you might think, God, I wish they would bury themselves in the news. I wish they would know what's going on with CPS. I wish they would know what was going on with map money. Um, but ultimately, this was the fear at the time, that people would spend all their time looking inside newspapers and not talk to each other on the buses or the trains or at work or at lunch breaks. And what happened is this mildly became true, that people would spend more time, you can see this at any airport you go to, people tend to be buried in a product and not necessarily as conversational as they used to be. When television came along, the big American fear is that we were going to amuse ourselves to death, or as Northwestern's Newton Minow would say, is that TV is a vast wasteland and we're all going to get lost there. Um, and I think that the point of this is really true. The average American now watches um, television 6.6 .6 hours a day. And if you think what's on television, it's a lot of real housewives and uh, you know the voice. And there's a lot of. Um, kind of what you might think of amusement on television. And so I think while this did not 
come true, there are a mild implications of what happens when television came along. And then to jump quickly to what I'm going to spend my time talking about today is that we worried with mobile devices that people would prefer their phones to their friends. And you can go to any restaurant in the world and you can see people buried in their phones rather than talking to their spouse or talking to their friends. You can go downstairs at Norris and see this. And I think this is something that really kind of has taken over the media business in a way. What we definitely know is we all prefer our phones to meetings. Um, I, there's a, a colleague of mine came to me and said, well, your name came up in the meeting, but I'm not sure what was said because I was looking at my phone. And I thought, well, did it seem like it was good news or bad news? Like, can you just give me something tonality about it? Because this is a real thing where something is happening off to the side, it's happening underneath the table, it's happening in the movies. And it's happening everywhere. And the reality is, for those of us who really study the emergence of mobile media, why is it happening becomes important. And the reality is, mobile offers something that's better than what's happening in front of you. For whatever reason you're looking for at the time, it may be more productive. Are you looking to make a to-do list? How many times have you said, oh, I'm, I am talking to you, but I just want to pull up my phone and write down what you just told me to do, or I just want to double check when my next meeting is. It might provide some productivity outlet. It might have more engagement. Do you pull up Instagram or Facebook because it's just more interesting to do that than what's happening in front of you? More educational, again, especially when you're looking for information about something, I'm gonna Wikipedia it, I wanna see when did this happen or when was that, that we find that kind of information on our mobile devices. More pleasurable and more egocentric. It is about satisfying your needs and not the needs of the other people in the moment. And we see it, this is just one cultural example, but I think one that really drives it home. We think about the Super Bowl commercials as something that really moves the marketplace, right? All this attention to Super Bowl commercials. 91% of mobile users turn to their devices during those commercials. So this thing that we think about, this cultural zeitgeist of Super Bowl commercials, still this idea that I can go to my mobile device and look for something or follow up on something or email somebody becomes part of the cultural moment. And as I give the example of meetings, or I can give the example of any lecture I give, I actually gave a lecture on Monday um, to NU admitted students, and a dad raised his hand and said, well, how do you deal with, mo how do you keep everyone's attention with mobile phones in the classroom? And I actually wanted to put up this slide, which said, well, I am not Beyonce. So I, it is a challenge in the marketplace. The only time we really see kind of dips are when there are things like this that are more entertainment oriented. So mobile usage during the Super Bowl was lowest only when Beyonce was on stage, not during any other time during the halftime show. For anyone who watched it, there was kind of an opening and then Beyonce came on. Only when Beyonce was on stage did we see this dip in mobile media usage. So it's interesting to say kind of what is happening in a moment where people are so captured by their mobile devices. And the reality is we're captured by our mobile devices because they're constantly alerting us. And especially for those of us who really get that kind of feeling in our belly, like that red dot, I just have to make it go away, I just have to read it. <laughs> I have a friend who doesn't have any anxiety about the red dot. She has 63 unread texts. And I said, Jennifer, why do you have 63 unread texts? She goes, well, everything important is in the first line. So you know how it gives you just the first two lines? I said, what if there's something important in the third line? She goes, well, they just didn't get to it fast enough. So she only reads like the first. It has totally changed how I text her. I'm like, dinner, 6 o'clock, location. Don't be late, <laughs> you know, right? Because now I realize she's never reading past the third line. But this is a real thing. This is causing what we study is a lot of psychological tension for people. People feel the push. It's not like email. All these self-help books about how you can deal with email on your desktop, check it twice a day, remove yourself. Yeah, but the, the phone is in your pocket. So now all these alerts are right at you. And there's a difficult way to distinguish between what's really important and what's not. And the only way to do that you feel like is to look through all of them. So I'm going to kind of continue this conversation, focus specifically on the social media piece and how we see social media changing um, when we look at mobile devices specifically. So just to give you a sense of scale, this is about internet users who are most active on our three most popular um, social media channels, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. A lot of times when I talk about this, people are surprised that YouTube is considered a social media channel. All you have to do is scroll down to the bottom of all that commentary. It's an incredibly verbose commentary, kind of engaged community, especially actually in the news space. 
There's some outstanding um, alternative news voices, something like the Young Turks is in that space, really covering international news for a millennial audience. Vice works in that space until they started to move into the um, HBO space. So that's a good example of where we tend to not think about it as a social media, but it really is. So this um, lays out for you percentage of internet users who are members of the site. That just means they've registered or they use the site. Visitors are people who've been there once a month. And then active users are people who use it twice a week or more. So you can start to see what happens. In fact, Facebook has a lot of members, but YouTube gets a lot of repeat visits. And then we see active users. Why do people go back to Facebook? Because I constantly feel this need to satisfy what's psychologically going on with me and my friends. It's not surprising to see Google Plus has a whole lot of members and a whole lot of people who don't really use it, right? And that's what's interesting, kind of what's going on in the psychological balance of the space. Ultimately, as you think about all these channels, promoting yourself, taking care of your online images is complicated enough. It's more complicated by the fact that you carry this thing all the time. So did you post that you're here today and you were supposed to be somewhere else today? Did you post what you ate for lunch and your spouse told you you really should not be eating chocolate? You know, whatever it is, you are complicated by the fact of how what you share becomes part of your online identity. And you're more tempted to share because your sharing device is constantly available to you. So we know that the average person has five social media accounts. You can kind of think about yourself and think about how you stack up against that. It doesn't necessarily you mean you use all of those accounts, but you've registered and have a presence on five social media accounts. And the average person spends an hour and 40 minutes every day browsing or posting. An hour and seven minutes of that time is on mobile. So of the hour and 40 minutes that people spend browsing or posting on social media, an hour and seven of those minutes are through mobile devices. And so I think you start to see why this thing, I posted my breakfast to Instagram this morning because my dad was very concerned about my healthy breakfast. And I was trying to kind of be funny. And so I'm going to show you my Instagram at the end. But it's a great example of something that I couldn't have done. I suppose I could have taken a picture, but I would have had to go back to my desktop and then reload it. The phone really makes things seamless to post, but it also means people don't tend to think as much about what they should be doing, right? Oops, I should take that down. I got myself into trouble when my grandmother was still alive. I would go visit her in California. My grandmother was 98, died just a couple months ago, and I went to an exercise class there, and one of the real housewives was in my exercise class. And I posted, you know, only in LA does a real housewife show up. At you. And my husband called me. My husband has called me four times in our marriage. <laughs> One, when he cut his finger off. We'd been married six months. He cut his finger off at home. And as a new bride, I was like, well, we need to talk about it. He goes, honey, I'm trying to drive a stick vehicle to the hospital with my finger cut up. I'm hanging up on you. So that was one situation where he called. The second situation when he called was when someone was sick. The third was when the hot water heater exploded. And the fourth, sadly enough, was this soul cycle class when I said, um, this real housewife, he goes, Rachel, if you post that a celebrity was there, they're going to kick you out of Soul Cycle. He had read that in Business Week or something. You need to take that down. You are going to be cut out of exercise classes across the country because it was an impulse. How cool is this? I'm in LA and this famous person is here. He, you have to take that down or they're not going to let you go to Soul Cycle anymore. So I, that's a great example. You have this impulse for something to be in your pocket. My husband, by the way, did call me yesterday. So five now in my marriage. Um, so ultimately, what we notice is that while social media has become ubiquitous, there are a couple important trends that are happening when it's in our pocket. Younger people share more. That's not entirely surprising for any of you who have kids or all of us who work on college campuses. Younger people share more. We don't see a backlash against this. By the way, we keep thinking people, younger people are going to get concerned about their privacy. All of a sudden, we're waiting for this big privacy thing to happen. It doesn't seem to be happening with the generation as they age. Finally, younger people are more likely to mix their personal and professional narratives, to have a lot more comfort level with this. And for those of us who study this as an area, that's one thing they've really gotten right. And I think probably for you to hear that is a big shocker. Because as we age, we tend to think these th two things should be separate. 
All the evidence suggests that you're going to be more successful in social media if you have a comfort level mixing your professional and personal lives. And I'm going to talk to you about why. One is that if you're not on social media at all because you're trying to maintain your professional persona, people think it's strange. And their minds jump to why would this person not be on social media? It just doesn't make sense. So I always say to people, if you don't do anything, how about just a LinkedIn profile? You don't have to jump to the big end of the pool. You don't have to join Facebook. But when people Google you and you are totally absent from social media, the mind drifts and it makes up its own narrative. So I think it's always good advice to be somewhere with what you choose to have there. The second thing is, even in private accounts, I'm a big believer that nothing you put out there is private, even if it's private, because people can take a screenshot, people can send it, a security blip could happen. So you need to be comfortable saying, I'm okay that my boss knows that on Sunday afternoon I ate a cheeseburger. You know, you have to have some affinity in saying, you know you have a work, you know you have a life, and even online you can have a work-life balance. And this is something that we see again and again. And I'm going to talk to you about kind of how it manifests itself across four kind of primary channels and then four channels that I'm guessing you're a little less familiar with, um, just to give you an introduction. So Twitter. Twitter is a great example, something that's very popular in the media business specifically. We see this as a real center of where media professionals aggregate. And for that reason, it's a great news source. If you think about kind of the area in which you operate within the university, if you're looking for news about that area, it's a great way to follow what's happening in the moment. It just is where a lot of news producers go to disseminate information. So, I, what I've kind of put at the top is what it is, and at the bottom, some ideas for you to engage with this channel. So the key ways to engage on Twitter are to retweet, reply, or direct message to established connections. So really think about Twitter as a way to build a network of people with whom you're interested in what news is happening. I think that's the best way to think about using it for your professional development. So I follow things like the New York Times and writers from the Wall Street Journal who I want to see, and maybe students who are in jobs that I'm interested in what's going on. Ultimately, the idea is to follow relevant topics to your career and follow any hashtags that might be relevant. So Northwestern might be one, undergraduate education might be one, whatever it is for you. And then what we notice broadly for companies, especially for you, those of you who are in the marketing or admissions field, is that on Twitter what's most successful are people talking about how they benefit others. It really is an outward reaching form where the connections really seem to be successful if you think about here's how I can benefit you as opposed to just using it as a posting tool. On Facebook, which is obviously the most member, the most used um, social network, ultimately the idea is not many people give the advice of you know, use your privacy, set up two profiles. You can have a public profile and a private profile. I think that is a very dangerous thing to do. You, the last thing you would want, especially from a mobile device, is to post to the wrong one, or to think which one's who's here and who's not here. You just really want to think, what am I comfortable saying to the world through a megaphone? And that's the best advice I can give any generation of people. But I think ultimately, oh, it copied it twice there for you. Um, I think that becomes the key element there, starting to think about building a trust network of people who you feel comfortable sharing with. Because relying on that that network, the people who are posting to you, other people see. So your network becomes very transparent on Facebook, and you want to be conscientious about that. Um, one thing about LinkedIn is LinkedIn is where we see trust at its highest, that people feel there that these are people that I really, I'm comfortable you using my name. I saw, met you through Rachel. I noticed you guys worked at the Arizona Republic together. That trust is a big deal here, and that's very complicated for those of us who interact with a lot of students or a lot of people who just you know, want to be in our LinkedIn network. So I'm always warning people to think very carefully about who they want to kind of accept into their trusted network. If not that any of you would be job hunting, because you're so happy here at Northwestern. But if you were looking for something, even an internal move inside Northwestern, ultimately the key is to think about this as an online resume. 
What we see here is that social things, self-promotion, does not really work here. It really turns people off. They don't think of it as a sales channel like they do Twitter. But here we really want to see kind of your online professional face. Assume you're at a networking event. Do I want to meet you because that's beneficial to me and potentially beneficial to you? Then I should join your group. And so this becomes a big deal. The second piece we see here is that people want to see a current headshot. And when people don't think your headshot is current, they find that skeptical. So I would encourage you, if nothing else, if you're on LinkedIn, upload something that looks close to what you look like now. It can be in flattering light, it can be at home, it can be, you know, whatever. But that's a big part of kind of establishing trust in that space. Many people remain very visual learners in that way. Fin finally, Pinterest is another example of something that people tend not to think as much about a social network. Pinterest is for people who pin images specifically. What we notice here is this is particularly successful for people trying to do professional networking in creative fields. So if you're in graphic design or media, or if you work in a department that's trying to attract students in music or other creative fields, art history, that we see a lot of successful networking happening in this space. The one thing when we study it specifically is that Pinterest has very different needs for men and for women. Women use it as a wish list. Here's what I dream of. Men use it as a shopping cart. So this is what I'm going to buy. This is the technology that I want. This is the sofa that I want. This is the television that I want. So understanding that can help you understand, especially if you're trying to attract people to your program or to your work. But if you're in a creative field and you're not on Pinterest, this is something to think about, especially for young people who are in that space. Um, so here are the four that I think maybe are not your super comfort level, but you might see in the media. So I thought, I can't do this without introducing you to what kind of is at the edge of social media right now. And one is Snapchat. So this, I kind of put up here a Snapchat example so you can see this is what Snapchat is really about. It's about these pins and stickers and throwing up rainbows. So you take snaps, these very brief kind of they're meant to be candid moments. One of the reasons Snapchat has been very successful is that people feel like more formal um, social media channels require, you know, if I'm going to take a picture of this table, I want to make sure this is exactly right and the Northwestern logo is showing and I want to take it overhead with the great light and I want to make sure everything is beautiful. Snapchat is meant to feel authentic. And then people have taken it over with all of these are the hearts you can put on your eyes, the rainbows, the um, old person face, there's a little crab logo here, this is an angry face happening. So ultimately people put these kind of filters on, share it with their friends, and expect kind of a conversation to ensue based on pictures. What's interesting about Snapchat if you talk to the people who founded it is it's intentionally complicated. The reason for that is they want you to be forced to spend a ton of time figuring it out because that investment will cause you to come back and use it more frequently. So the more seamless we make something, the easier it is for you to pop in and out. Snapchat believes that the more comp, has anyone ever tried Snapchat? It's so confusing, don't you? I mean, just to get into it is, you gotta understand the language. But once you're there, it's been incredibly successful and we see a lot of media brands moving to this space now. You just have to understand what all that means. Um, when we think about sort of if Snapchat represents our authenticity, what, what represents basically the perfect photo of our idyllic lives, it's Instagram. So here is the place that people go to look perfect. You know, this is me on a plane going on spring break, and here's my pina colada. It's never the pile of papers I need to grade or the laundry that didn't get done yesterday. That is not what happens on Instagram. No one reveals their nasty secrets on Instagram. Ultimately, these photos at the bottom, the filters, excuse me, are meant to give it a professional feel. It is designed to make you look better than you are. You can take a mediocre photo and put a little Nashville haze on it, and all of a sudden you look like your macaroon has just been taken by Food & Wine magazine. That macaroon, it just looks like a million bucks. And therefore, it tends to be very aspirational. You know, that's where we go to say, oh, I want to go to that island, or I want to you know, make that for breakfast, or I want to, you know, my kids to wear that cute little outfit. In reality, you just want to get out the door with a power bar in your bag and you want to get to work on time. But that's not what's happening on Instagram. 
Vine is another example. So Vine are six second videos and six seconds may seem like kind of a short period of time, but it's amazing how much creativity is put into this space now. Um, and Vine is really about showing off your creativity. It really is about messaging in a funny, quirky way. And rather than um, trying to describe it to you, I thought I would show a few. A lot of what happens on Vine is not terribly politically correct. So I've tried to find three that could be videotaped with the Northwestern logo at the bottom and that I would feel comfortable <laughs> if this ever got replayed. So I think I've done that. But just to give you a sense of it, here are kind of three vines that give you a sense of what's going on on the space. Uh. <laughs> Chocolate milk in the mouth. Hey, can I have a large number three, please? Real easy to see, so you can check. I think that has something to do with SpongeBob. Isn't that the SpongeBob song? Sorry, I called them Snapchats there. They're really vines. That shows I was working on this on Saturday night. Um, <laughs> but that's what's happening on Vine. People put a lot of production value for what, I mean, there's some thoughtfulness that goes into these things, right? I ordered the number three. I had that three in the car. Um, I, just, I watched that. <laughs> when I just had a bad day, those chocolate chips in her mouth when she pours the milk. I don't know, every time I see it, I think it's funny. But Vine, <laughs> it has lost no, the novelty effect has lost on me. I just think it's hilarious. But this is a great example of what's happening there. People are investing a lot of time in kind of what does it look like in pictures. And one of the big differences about Vines is that they autoplay. So while you go through, if you join Vine and you, you don't have to click on anything, you just keep going and they keep auto playing for six seconds. So it's meant to be kind of a stimulus that might pass the time when you're in line at the DMV or I wouldn't play it at a meeting because they auto play. So if the video sound is not off, you're going to get, you know, that SpongeBob song might get you in trouble at Jake's next meeting. So Finally, um, I think you cannot speak at a university and not talk about Yik Yak. And I pulled um, the Northwestern did a story about the Northwestern Chronicle did a story about Yik Yak in 2014. So I pulled those comments so that I wasn't exposing you to anything new, because sometimes they can be pretty raunchy and pretty direct. And the reason for that is it's anonymous. It's anonymous and it's local, and that's why it tends to work on things like university campuses. So while it's been banned at a lot of middle schools and high schools. It is just kind of the authentic way that people say what's going on in their lives. And you can vote things up or down using this um, mechanism right here. And the key really becomes it's a peek into what's happening in the geographic community. If any of you have young people going to college, I actually think this is a, you get the di tonal difference between us and the University of Chicago if you just look at Yik Yak. Just five minutes and you'll see the difference right away. Um, because you're allowed to peek in at other geographic locations. So you could join Yik Yak and you could go back and look at your undergraduate institution and what the young people are talking about there. And it's not representative because not every young person is doing it, but you can start seeing kind of somewhere, these are, these are very college student things to say. Nowhere in the syllabus say, I need to be sober. Apparently it also didn't teach you grammar very well. <laughs> um, the weather, I mean, some of them are funny, though. The weather app is the reason I have trust issues. I mean, that should be on a t-shirt. That's a good line. Like, yeah, should I have brought my umbrella today? You know, I mean, so, but all of these things have some, I, I, they have references that I'm not even sure that I totally understand because I am not a Northwestern student. They're very kind of insightful into the, to kind of the, um, geographic location that you're in. So I think these are three places where kind of alternative social networking is happening, depending on the field, and maybe your kids are here, maybe you're spending time here. But this is kind of the next generation of what's happening as we see people, younger people, pulling away from Facebook because they feel like Facebook has been taken over people who look like me with too many gray hairs. And so they feel like I got to go find somewhere else where my professor is not. And so they go to places like this. So finally, if you remember nothing else, I think this is kind of, I meant to be the most helpful takeaway. Just remember this if you don't care about any of the other social medias. When we study what's happening on social media, these are the things we find successful for professional presentations of the self. 
One is to be current, that your title, your name, we have a huge issue, especially with women who change their names when they're married or not married. You, your name has to be current and that your headshot should be current. There's a lot of shock. People feel a real lack of authenticity if they show up and you don't look like that, or they Google you and there's more current pictures of you. Be consistent. So in essence, you can think about your tone across platforms, but be consistent. Don't let someone see you on LinkedIn and then see you on Facebook you know, doing things that you kind of think, really? That person who's the vice president of this is doing that on the weekends? That being consistent across platforms doesn't have to be the same, but you have to have a comfort level in saying, this is my whole self. Be compelling. So we find the most successful social media networking is very direct and very concise. If Twitter has taught us something, it's that being direct and clear and concise is very successful in social media. Media. If you're able to be clever, all the better, but I can never coach cleverness. You know, I mean, it's just, you can't teach people to be funny. Um, be critical. Well, maybe you can, but I can't. Um, be critical. And so um, really be thoughtful about who's in your social network, because you will not only be judged by what you post, but you will be judged by who you accept into your social network. In many cases, you don't have control over that. You don't have control over who likes your photos on Instagram, but in the cases that you do, LinkedIn's a great example. Facebook is a great example. When you accept somebody, you are accepting all of their views, political, social, pictures, all of them are coming into your space. And then finally, be cognizant of your tone. And this is what I tell people who say, well, I really want to do Instagram, but you know, my day job is pretty buttoned up and tie oriented. I said to Jake earlier, you know this is not a faculty meeting. I've never seen so many ties in my life. <laughs> I go to a faculty meeting and no one has a tie on. Uh, but so you can flex your identity. You can show different sides of yourself across different social media channels, but you just have to be cognizant of when they're included in the whole, do you feel comfortable with yourself in that way? So I'm gonna show you just two of mine, So and I'll give you an example of how I use them. So this is Twitter. This is me on Twitter. I do a lot of talking with my students about how to present professional profiles on Twitter. That in, how do you start talking about issues related to media and journalism in this space? And my students are encouraged to use this kind of at Medill hashtag. And so I follow them, I retweet it, I like it. That this really is my social media where I talk about work. And you'll see that my, um, Description there says on Twitter, professor at Northwestern's Medill School, thinking about journalism, audiences, and engagement. And then in parentheses, it says all work. On Instagram, I give them my Instagram handle, all play. And this is my Instagram. So these are the things that I feel comfortable saying that this is when I do, when I'm not, you know, kind of worried about your grades. And I know that's shocking for my students to think you're not home worried about what I'm going to get in my class all the time. I don't understand. But this is what I do when that's not happening. I was in North Carolina, and that gigantic cow was on the, tra the tram in front of me in the car, which I thought was hilarious. These are the things that I feel comfortable sharing as part of my profession. And here, it says my name, and it says all play on Instagram, and it uses a bunch of emojis about the things that I post on Instagram, and then all work on Twitter, and refers you back to here. So I feel comfortable with them as a whole, but if you said to me, anyone in this room, I'd love to find you on social media, I'm sure some of us will be friends after this, but I would send you here. And when my friends say to me, oh, I'd like to be friends with you on social media, I send them here. But I'm comfortable if you found the other one. And that really becomes the key to having a healthy social media presence. Um, so I hope that was helpful. And I hope if there are any questions, I think we have a few minutes left. I'm happy to take them. They have mics. So if they don't come to you, I'll repeat your question. But um, thank you for having me today. It was a joy to do. And I appreciate you guys making me look good for my dad. So even if this was a total bomb from your perspective, I'm going to call my dad for this and tell him I hit it out of the park. <laughs> so <laughs> ask me really thoughtful questions. It'll make me feel better. <laughs> yes. Um, on LinkedIn, there's a, there's a way that people can endorse you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. Sure. 
I don't know you that well. So the question was about endorsements on Twitter. You might get these things where so-and-so endorsed you for skills, and often you're LinkedIn, excuse me, on LinkedIn, and it might be something that's someone that's two tiers removed from you. They don't know anything about my leadership skills. Why are they endorsing me for that? So there's two things I know for sure. That's not a specific area that I study, but here are the two things I know for sure. One, people who are endorsing you are looking for you to endorse them back because they are usually job hunting or thinking about job hunting. Employers don't care about endorsements, and I encourage people never to endorse back because you just there's a lot to lose and almost nothing to gain from that process. Now, if you know someone very well and you feel comfortable endorsing, please do, but it has not become um, social capital the way LinkedIn had hoped it would be, so it's not, and I would be very cautious about doing it for someone that you would not be willing to say, good housekeeping seal of approval. But most people who are doing it are doing and especially if you're connected to students, right? They're going to endorse. You may be awful on the CTEC. That sounds like a faculty member. But you're fabulous on LinkedIn because they want you to endorse their writing skills or whatever it is. But I would encourage you to kind of stay out of that space. There was another. Yes. And about um, iFunny. Sure. And what you thought, how does that kind of play into, into the social media? What do you mean? So my son loves iFunny. Okay. And he's on it all the time. How old is he? He's 14. Okay. So he, he follows it, and I just thought it was just these kind of funny things that you're supposed to look at. But then he talks about Would you about describe it, like it for people? I hear questions so of I, you. iFunny is, um, it's sometimes short videos, mm -hmm. but mostly it's just like pictures with captions. It's kind of like Vine, but just an image. Yeah. Um, but there's also a commenting thing, and there's the liking, and, and people have identities and build profiles for themselves through it. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it's, at first I just thought it was kind of like a comedy site, mm -hmm. but it's not. It seems more social media than that. I think that's right. I think it is more social media. I think it's less political commentary than Vine, so I think it's a safer space for younger people to be. I think a lot of the social media channels have become a place that you would be nervous about yeah, a I'm younger. <laughs> yeah, don't send your seven. Well, there's always people you can find on every social media channel that make it filthy dirty. But I do think iFunny just kind of prevents a different forum in that way. And it's more of a combination of stills and videos, which we haven't seen as successful with other social media channels. So Instagram's a great example. They're trying to really play up their video presence, but it's still a very photo-based Platform. So there's trying to get some comfort level and aggregating people who are interested in comedy and errors, but there's so much more diversity of content there that it's hard to kind of categorize it in that way. I would tend to categorize it as almost an interest group, like a social media with an interest group, um, of which many of you might be involved in some of those kind of things. There's a ton of social media channels, for example, say Bass Fishermen, you know, where they share where do we fish and what lures are working. You know, it's a very kind of specific thing. And that's kind of how I think about something like iFunny. Yeah. I just had a quick question. Is you commented a lot on how much time you spend on the mm -hmm. but how do you think it's affected, um, sorry, how do you think it's affected our attention spans? Like when you talk about six second videos and yeah. you're watching them rapidly, do you think it's having a negative impact on like, I can't watch anything longer than six seconds. I need all my information that quickly. You know, it's funny. Um, I'm not an expert in the area of kind of attention span, so I'm going to answer this from a very, um, layperson perspective. Um, the first um, BuzzFeed live video, I wish I had it up, um, that did um, a live feed on Facebook. Did anyone see the exploding watermelon in the last week? OK, so they took a watermelon, and these two people dressed in you know, kind of full lab gear started putting rubber bands on a watermelon till so many watermelons that the so many rubber bands that the watermelon exploded. And it took 44 minutes, and 800,000 people watched the whole thing. Now, whether they sat there and like watched the whole thing while doing nothing else, I think what actually it's caused is not an issue with attention spans, but with people who think they can do two things at once. So we see attention to longer form things when they're engaging, like the exploding watermelon. And those of you who have 10 seconds, you can watch the first minute and the last minute, and you get all the funniness without all the waiting in between. But you might want to see it. Um, so I actually think it's less of an issue about attention spans and more about people who can think they are um, can do many things at one time. That has a, issues to do with efficiency, ability to do things correctly the first time. But I, I'm not sure it's about attention spans as much as it is about multiple stimuli at one time. But again, not specifically my area. So that's a very kind of 
just because I pay attention approach to it. Yeah. So about five years ago, I had gone to a presentation where somebody talked about um, the way that younger people were using social media and actually sort of implementing their own privacy in that. Mm -hmm. And I know that you said that they're not as concerned about privacy, but do you think that maybe the reason why we're seeing less concern about privacy is because there are these other social media tools that they can use that are giving them that outlet? Yes, yeah, so I think that they perceive that there is privacy where privacy does not exist. So I think they're moving to other social media channels that they perceive as private. And Snapchat is a great example, right? We've all seen the stories about how I think, you know, when I send you a snap and it disappears, it, no one's ever gonna see it again unless someone takes a screenshot and then shares it with the National Enquirer. And so I think that's a great example where young people perceive privacy where there really is not privacy. So I think it's that they've moved off mainstream social media to more niche social media, but I would argue to you it's kind of, um, it's not privacy, it's ignorance. That's what I would say. That, and I would say to you, even if you think you have a private profile, I wouldn't post anything to it. You wouldn't want Jake to read. You know, I mean, <laughs> like I just think that to me, that becomes, now, this is when I was on spring break, so I'm allowed, this is my husband golfing, right? I mean, I am comfortable saying, if Brad says to me, what do you mean you were not working 27 you know, 24 seven, it was spring break. I was allowed, you know, the classes weren't in session. I don't think I'd post a picture of my husband golfing and me in a sun hat, you know, on the first day of classes when I'm supposed to be in the classroom engaging with that moment. So I do think you have to be conscientious of that. And I'm just not a big believer that privacy screens really protect you from what could happen. But now that's, I'm pretty, you know, risk sensitive. And I'm sure Northwestern would like you to be too. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm curious if you guys looked at or if you have any thoughts on like Slack and kind of the blending of kind of social networking and now email um, and kind of whether that's going to replace email in the long term or anything. Well, it's interesting. I mean, email is um, a dying medium because younger people use it only for the function of their jobs or school. So we see this emergence of a generation of people who look at email. In fact, there was a great article in the journal a couple weeks ago that studied 18-year-olds and was talking about how the idea that people think it is more um, kind of a sign of adulthood that you check email every day than if you vote. Because email just feels like something your dad does. And that's where you go when you have a class assignment or your workplace wants to communicate with you. But you would never send a note saying, you want to have drinks tonight on email. And so I do think the emergence of new technologies that replace email, especially kind of group emailing, Slack is a great example, are going to be part of the next generation of communication. I don't really see anytime soon it replacing organizational communications. I think we're pretty set in that way. But I think we're probably 20 years out from there being a technology that means you're not really at North, you know, RD Mercy at Northwestern.edu. Yes, I, yes, yes, please, sorry. I'm curious about your commentary regarding the use of social media during mm -hmm. this presidential election cycle. Also, uh, sort of off topic, but with regard to how Twitter's being used to somehow bypass the traditional media outlets to get to the public and voters, et cetera? So um, Twitter and the presidential election is interesting because we have a candidate who always gives us something interesting on Twitter. Thank you, Donald Trump. Um, and so I do think this is a moment where kind of direct access is an interesting thing. I also think this is a moment where you've seen even comments from all of the camps that show the immediacy and maybe less kind of should I have had this double checked. You know, it's not the same thing as a press release. Maybe I should have thought about that language before I did that. Um, so I think that it's making campaigns more raw, more available to the public, but I also think the campaign cycle moves faster. So something negative can happen on Twitter and you think it's really a deal breaker. It, we move on to the next thing so quickly that it's not the same thing as really screwing up a press release or really making a major error in a campaign. So I think it's just, it becomes fodder in that way. Um, the second part of your question was about... Oh, bypass the media. What's interesting about Twitter and the media and politics is this. When we talk to people about where did you learn about a political issue, it's always through the mainstream media. So what's smart about what politicians are doing is that media elites are on Twitter. If you want 
what you're talking about covered in the media, it's a great idea to tweet it, not because Joe Schmo's going to read it, but because someone at the New York Times is going to read it and then maybe report on it the next day. And if the New York Times reports on it, then the television news is going to report on it and there's a trickle down effect in the media. So I think it is a bypass. It's actually more of a way to do things less formal. And you see more and more on television. Here are the tweets about that. I mean, watch the Today Show any morning. Here's what people are tweeting about uh, related to what happened with you know, Ivy Park and Beyonce's launch of a new, who cares what some Twitter person in Duluth thinks about it. But ultimately, mainstream media is in trying to engage the public by using Twitter in that way. And so I actually think politicians are smart. I think it gives them more direct access, and the media are not being vigilant enough about not using it as kind of the fodder for the next day's news. Yeah. My comment is, it's not a question, but a comment that has to do with something that's not really social media, but it is just a trend that um, I'm noticing. So I run the Career Center at McCormick, mm -hmm. and students don't even pay attention to voicemails. Mm -hmm. So I watched a recruiter trying to call students after a career fair to offer them an interview for the next day. And nobody called them back. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the email thing. I mean, it is about social media in some ways, in the same way young people don't check email like we do. They expected that they would be texted. Mm -hmm. Text and me. the recruiters, 45-year-old recruiters are like, I, I call you. Mm -hmm. That's why you have a phone. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I will say that I think one of Northwestern's best advantages, though, is when they started, do they do this for everyone or just for me? They, do, <laughs> I'm like, wait, maybe I have some kind of technology I'm not supposed to talk about. Where they send me, you just got a phone call in your office and you can listen to it. It has changed my life. Because now, no one knows I'm not in the office. No problem. Happy to call you back. But that's a great example. So I think technology like that is going to... Someone will figure out how to take your voicemails and tweet them to you, and that will change how young people communicate. That's really what Slack's done for email. So things like that will happen, because young people don't like to talk on the phone, and they don't like to respond to email unless they want something. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is really great to uh, give guidance on how to set your social presence and what to communicate out. Do you have any guidance on the other side of it, on information to get? Because it's so overwhelming with all the different uh, social media channels out there, and then even within that, what to follow, what not to follow. Do you have any kind of similar guidance as to like, you know, on how to consume information? Sure, absolutely. I would say what I have found particularly successful are these two strategies. One, I follow news sources on Twitter. So news sources that I would like to consume every day but don't have the time, which you can all probably make a list of those, right? I don't have time to read The Atlantic. I don't have time to read The New Yorker. I don't have time. So on Twitter, I think that is a very smart place to follow news brands. It's a great place when you have five minutes to pop in and say, oh, here's what's going on. You don't feel compelled to read the whole thing. You can follow 10 news brands and have a really robust Twitter feed that takes care of you. I always encourage you to follow someone who disagrees with you. Right? As, a, as a media um, faculty member, I do not encourage you only to follow media that you know, focus on your point of view as it is right now. Go follow somebody that challenges you to think differently. But I think Twitter is a great place to do that. And I encourage people to try to check, to, if you can check it for five minutes once a day, you'll know what's going on buy a newspaper too, but if you can only do that, do that. And then I think if you're interested in anything kind of for your hobbies, it depends on the nature of what your hobbies are. I tend to focus on Instagram because I'm kind of a more, I like food, I like travel, and that really is successful in that platform. So I would pick one platform for your hobbies. And it may be that your hobbies are um, do-it-yourself oriented. Pinterest is in a great place to be because that's where you can go and say, you know, here's how do I build this, how do I paint my office, how do I you know, organize my kitchen. So depending on what your hobby is, I would pick one thing for your hobbies. And what we find then, if you really maintain two social media channels in that way, the Twitter piece, the news, feels a little like homework, You know, something I should probably just do to make sure I'm ready to talk around the water cooler. And the other thing feels like a release. You can check it a little later in the day when you don't want to hear about bombing in Syria. You know, It's just too emotionally overwhelming to talk about violence in Chicago. But this hobby thing can be very cathartic. It is what magazines used to be You know, when we sat down and read a glossy magazine. So I think that's the best strategy, to really think it is a, a two-prong approach that allows you to have a little bit of fish and fowl. You know, think about your professional self, but also to think about the other things that make your life whole. 
Well, that was probably a good note to end on because it felt like a man out of church, right? Go have a whole, <laughs> full, rich life with your work and your passions. You know, that was what I was really meant to say. Thank you guys for having me today. It was nice to do.